Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to class. I hope you all had a good uh, weekend. I hope I'm not echoing. Is my sound OK? Online students? Sound is fine? OK, thank you, Chira. Uh, so welcome, everyone, to class. We also want to welcome the e-learning students who will be listening to this uh, lecture later on. Um, we were looking at Chapter 5, Kingdom Builders Lifestyle. Uh, we'll continue looking at Chapter 5. Um, before that, we'll um, just pause for a word of prayer, and I'll ask Rin to lead us in prayer. Jesus, we thank you for this um, beautiful morning and that you have blessed us with, Lord. And I thank you for the breath in our lungs and everything that we have, and we are so thankful, Jesus. And Lord, today as we're gonna um, have our class, I pray that you um, that we will learn something today, and that we'll be able to apply it in our lives, and that uh, you'd help Pastor Selena to teach as well. Thank you, Father, for this time in your name. I pray, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Rin. So we're basically looking at Kingdom Builders' lifestyle, and um, um, you know, it's uh, for God. It's important who we are and the life we live as kingdom builders. So we are going to look at, we were looking at three main areas um, uh, in how we need to, you know, build ourselves up, okay? Uh, first area is, anyone knows which is the first area? Our character, yes, godly character. Second, what is the second one? Spiritual maturity and the third one is stewardship okay so last week we began looking at a godly character uh, we saw how character is developed we looked at uh, examples of daniel and joseph um, and uh, we also looked at why characters is important okay uh, now we look at um, the second area that is um 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 spiritual maturity okay now is spiritual maturity more uh, is more important than spiritual gifting or spiritual gifting is more important than spiritual maturity spiritual maturity is more important than spiritual gifting why do you think spiritual maturity is more important than your gifts you can take the mic please yeah if we don't have a spiritual uh, maturity we may uh, misuse the gifts that was god that god given for us and uh, we may also use it as they may as be dangerous in our hands okay we must we might misuse it waste the anointing and um, you know uh, would not be profitable okay what else they won't be power when we do it okay the power of god the anointing of god will not be released to minister to others anything else Okay, so we see that um, uh, our spiritual maturity is more important than your your uh, gifting. Okay, so if you're spiritually mature, uh, you know God can give you uh, a greater anointing, greater leading to do things, um, greater responsibility, and also the gifts that and the grace that will enable you to fulfill the function. Okay, so what is spiritual maturity? Uh, spiritual maturity, uh, when translated in English, basically means complete. But when you look at Greek, Greek is a much rich language, much richer language than English. You know, for uh, some of the Greek words, we'll have multiple words and multiple meanings, which can be, can be used in different contexts, which actually brings alive the truth and the the real um, uh, understanding, the real meaning of that sentence and really changes the sentence. So if, in, you know, when you study Greek, you study the Bible in Greek, a whole understanding of uh, the truth and the revelation in the New Testament will, br you know, just bring such a fresh revelation, such greater insight, such deeper uh, insights, okay? So we're going to look at three Greek words which talk about uh, spiritual maturity in various contexts in the New Testament. One is telios, the other one is pilero, and the other one is katharizo. 
Okay, so Telios, Pilerio, and Katarizzo. So Telios basically means, you know, being perfect, full of age, mature, being perfect. Pilerio means uh, basically to be full of or to be, uh, to be filled up. Okay, to fill up or to be full of. And katarizzo basically means to be thoroughly equipped. Okay, so we look at these three Greek words uh, where it is used in different uh, contexts in the um, in the New Testament. Wherever we see complete, it's basically talking about spiritual maturity, but it can mean either one of these words. It can mean either uh, telios, pilerio, or katarizzo. Okay, so even as we look at these uh, various uh, Bible passages, we will also see, uh, understand the seven characteristics of spiritual maturity. Okay, so if you look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, there it says, what does it say? Be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. So it's basically talking perfect in the sense of til uh, tilios. What is tilios? Uh, to be uh, to be uh, full of age, mature. Com okay, uh, the actually the word um, uh, uh, spiritual maturity means complete, but in different contexts here it is telios. Perfect means what? Full of age. Okay, telios, full of age. The word perfect here means being full of age. So you know, uh, basically Jesus is challenging us not to be childish. Because God is not childish. Okay, so we need to be mature. Look at what Ephesians 4.13 says. It says, till we come to be perfect. Okay, in the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man. To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So being uh, mature man, being perfect means we come to a place where we are basically in all things, we are manifesting the fullness of Christ. We are like Christ. We are like Jesus in every area of our life. We are manifesting him in every area of our um, lives. Colossians 1, 28 and 29 says, can somebody read that please? Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. To this end I also labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. Amen. So what is Paul saying? What? Why is he preaching and teaching? Why is he preaching and teaching? So that every person can be, pres uh, every man and woman can be presented as? Perfect. Perfect means, til, that word is telios, means what? Mature, complete, okay? Perfect, yes. Uh, the second characteristic is spiritual maturity is being perfect and complete in all the will of God, okay? So look at Colossians chapter 4, verse 12. But Paul is saying that he, the, the, their prayer is that the people or the believers be perfect, telios and complete pilero, okay, in all the will of God, okay? So which means, you know, spiritual maturity basically means that in every area of our lives, we are fully aligned, we are fully surrendered to the will of God. In everything that we do, whatever we preach, teach, whatever we do, we are completely aligned to the will of God. The third characteristic of spiritual maturity is that we are being thoroughly equipped for every good work. Okay, so growing spiritually mature means that we should be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Okay, so here uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul writing to the church at Corinth, he's saying, you know, it's our prayer that you be made complete. Complete is katharizo. What is katharizo? No, complete is uh, the general, <laughs> it's a general word. But what is katharizo? Being thoroughly equipped. Yes. So all of these words, you know, wherever we see spiritual maturity, whether, where, you know, telios, pilero, katharizo, it, it is uh, in English means complete. But when you're looking at it in the Greek sense, what is it? Katharizo means to be thoroughly equipped. Okay, so he's saying that, you know, it is our prayer that you be thoroughly 
equipped. Okay, so we what is what should we pray for believers? What should we pray for ourselves that we be thoroughly equipped? So spiritually mature means that we are you know thoroughly equipped, uh, that we are um, you know uh, aligned ourselves to the will of God, that we are mature in every area of our life, that in every area of our life we are like. Christ. We are growing into Christ likeness. Okay. So if you look at uh, 2 Corinthians 13, verse 11, it says, Finally, brethren, farewell, become complete. So he's saying, become complete, which means the responsibility is whose? Here. God or us? Us. He's saying, us. Okay. Become. You, we have to become. So sometimes we think spiritually mature, uh, being spiritually mature is the work of the Holy Spirit. It's only the work of the Holy Spirit. It's only the work of God. But we know that in every uh, aspect of Christian life, God or the Holy Spirit cannot work if we are not co-working or co-laboring or co-volunteering along with them okay so it's important that we become complete so the, the responsibility is ours it's not only ours but also if you look at hebrews chapter 13 uh, it says here that you know um, the the good shepherd the great good shepherd that is the lord jesus christ he will make you complete okay so even as we uh, work to into spiritual maturity we even as we work towards becoming complete in christ in all areas of our life okay and even as god works out his good in our lives it's also the work of the holy spirit it's also the work of god so he works in us bringing about what is well pleasing in his sight like we read in this uh, verse in hebrews chapter 13 okay Look at Luke chapter 6, verse 40. What does Jesus say there? Yes. Everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. So Jesus wants us to be like the master, okay, like the teacher. And for that, what do we have to go through? We need to go through a process of training and equipping. Okay. Um, even uh, in the fivefold ministry office, that of the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastors, and teachers, what is their responsibility? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12. It is to equip the saints, okay? Uh, equip the saints. That means equip uh, us to do every good work that God has purposed for us. So that is the work of those in the fivefold ministry. Okay, so um, the uh, spiritual maturity means that we are equipped in every good work. The fourth one, spiritual maturity means that we are in a place where we are able to receive solid meat, solid food. So when we read about solid meat, solid food, when Paul writes, uh, whether it's in Hebrews or Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, what do we mean by solid food or, or meat? Huh? Revelation, okay, that means we are in a place, we are so spiritually mature, we are uh, full of uh, spiritual wisdom and understanding, like Paul says, so that we can understand the mysteries of God or the mysteries of the kingdom of God, okay? So we will be able to receive wisdom and we'll be able to understand the mysteries of the kingdom of God when we are spiritually mature okay so that is what we see here in hebrews 5 6 uh, chapter 6 and first corinthians chapter 2 okay um so look at first corinthians chapter 2 verse 7 what does uh, paul write yes yeah, so he says we speak the wisdom of god in a mystery the hidden wisdom which god ordained for ages to come so he's saying that this mystery this wisdom that we're speaking cannot be understood by everyone and who can understand it those who are spiritually mature okay the fifth one is spiritually uh, the spiritual maturity uh, gets our senses trained to know what is good and evil okay so 
uh, when we are spiritually mature, we know what is bad, what is good, what is right, what is wrong, what is good, what is evil. Uh, we just don't know our soul, which means our mind, our emotions and our will is trained to know what is good and evil and is able to do what is good and overcome evil. Okay, So that is what Hebrews chapter 5 verse 14 says, that those... Uh, can somebody read that? Hebrews chapter 5 verse 14. Hebrews 5, 14, 11 to 14. Of whom we have much to say and here to explain since you have... Hebrews 5, 14. Page 93, please. Okay. Okay. No, it's there. Yeah. Okay. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who, by reason of use, have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Yes, thank you. Amen. So here he's saying those who are of full age, that means the word is teleos, okay, uh, is able to understand in their senses their full age, complete, perfect men. Okay, or women, and they have their senses trained to discern both good and evil. The sixth one is spiritual maturity is putting away childish behavior. Uh, we already saw that. It's, you know, in our behavior, in our attitudes, in our thinking, in our speaking, you know, in our thoughts, in our understanding, we are not childish. You know, to be childish is, when, when can we be childish? When we are more carnal in our nature in carnal in nature okay so when we're carnal in nature we can be more uh, childish we can behave childish childish behavior also here uh, can mean here when paul is writing to the church at corinth first corinthians chapter 3 verses 1 to 4 he says um, in verse 3 can you read that for you are verse 3 first corinthians chapter 3 verse 3 for you are still carnal for where there are envy strife and divisions among you are you not carnal and behaving like mere men mere men yes so here uh, it it shows that if you are not spiritually mature then you are somebody who is more carnal in your nature and that is why when people are carnal there we find more envy strife and uh, division okay the seventh one is spiritual maturity is having our whole body and tongue in control okay james chapter 3 verse 2 for we all stumble in many things if anyone does not stumble in word he is a perfect man able also to bridle the whole body amen so perfect here what is the greek word used Kilios, okay, mature man, perfect man, okay. So, in what area here is talking about spiritual maturity? In which area can we show ourselves spiritually mature? In the words that we speak, when we're able to control our tongue, and we know that self control is one of the important and also the fruit of the spirit, okay, and it's also a sign of maturity, okay. So, uh, now, spiritual maturity, does it just happen in a season? Does it happen in a, a period of time? What do you think? In a period of time? Uh, you mean in a, in a short frame of time or? Uh, it's a process, yes. It continues to, uh, you know, it's not something that happens instantly, not just for a season, a period, you know, but it's something that is a process, even as we, and how do we become more spiritual mature? How does the process happen? When you're renewing our mind, how do you renew your mind with the word of God, okay? Submitting to the person and the work of the Holy Spirit, yielding, yes, obedience to the Holy Spirit. What else? We also learn through life experiences, right? Yes, we learn through life experience. So all of this constantly helps us in progressing in spiritual maturity. Okay. Now the next one, the last one, which area do we uh, uh, are we going to look at regarding uh, kingdom lifestyle? We looked at character, spiritual maturity. The last one is stewardship. Okay. What is the meaning of stewardship? Mm 
What is stewardship? Being a disciple, being a manager. Take care of something that has been entrusted to you or somebody's trusted something to you, given to you, and you take care of that. Okay. Good. What else? So as a steward, stewardship is not ownership. Okay. To properly handle what has been entrusted to you. Okay. Good. Okay. Uh, what are we stewards of in the kingdom of God? What are we stewards of in the kingdom of God? The spiritual gifts, yes. People that have been entrusted to us. The authority that God has given to us, yes. Good. What else? The word of God. Yes, that's very important, right? Yes. So uh, what do we mean by stewardship? Now, the Greek word for steward is um, comes from two root words. Oikos means house. And nomos means a law. Okay. So stewardship, the Greek word is oikonomos or oikonomia. Okay. Which means managing a household or it's basically administering a household. Okay. So you're basically a, a manager who's managing an estate or home, you know, uh, managing everything that is uh, has been entrusted to you. Okay, so a steward is basically a manager, somebody who's a caretaker of a house, an estate, property, building, whatever, an overseer. Okay, somebody who's put in charge of somebody else's property, somebody else is taking care of somebody else's good, their field, their goods, their fields, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, and their um, uh, their property basically. Okay. And also it is something, someone who is responsible for somebody else's uh, uh, property, somebody else's goods or somebody else's things. Okay. Now, uh, like we said, we are stewards of the gospel, the mysteries of God, the grace of God that has been given to us. Okay. So as stewards, in, uh, are we stewards in the kingdom of God? Why do we call ourselves a steward of the kingdom of God? We're basically sons and daughters, right? We're also heirs, co heirs with Jesus Christ. Why are we calling ourselves as stewards? Yeah, we are here to take care of God's kingdom. Okay, we're here to bring, uh, you know, uh, his kingdom here and his will be done here on earth. Okay, so as stewards, what must we ensure doing? towards what should we ensure that we do or make sure that we do and what are the characteristics of a good steward okay so uh, uh, a good steward ensures proper functioning that everything is in order everything goes well everything is the, and nothing is beyond reproach okay and a good steward also ensures or makes sure that there is profit right not just taking care of the property and not getting any benefit, you know, uh, 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 any profit or any fruit from the estate or the property. Okay. So he should ensure that there is fruitful work that is done. Okay. Whether it's taking care of the property and looking after it in a neat, uh, in a good way, or also ensuring that there is a good harvest, a good reaping, a good fruit that um, that is um, uh, is uh, uh, required okay also we need to see that if an a, a man a steward should also assess to find out if you know there is fruit if there's productivity if there is no fruit there's no productivity what do we do as stewards yes we try some other strategies methods what else we make some changes to ensure that there is uh, some kind of productivity, some good fruit that is born. A good steward also ensures accountability, right? Who are we accountable to? Huh? To God, right? You remember what Joseph tells Potiphar's wife? You know, he uh, he's made me uh, in charge of his entire household. So how can I do this against him and against God? So we are... Uh, stewards and we are accountable to God and also accountable to the government that God has placed in our 
life okay uh, the authority that god has placed in our life and then we need to carry out kingdom work with this deep sense of accountability so even when nobody is watching who is watching you god that is very very important if we lose foresight of that nothing can keep us in ministry nothing can humble us nothing can um, you know um, uh, stop us from falling into sin and breaking god's heart and grieving the spirit of god if we don't have this in our in our mind that hey god is watching i am accountable to god ultimately not just do it because the person is watching but i do it because i am accountable to god okay so a good steward is not somebody who wastes or is unproductive but is somebody who's uh, you know productive in what has been entrusted to them managing things very very well a good steward also ensures security a good steward actually guards and protects so what do we guard and protect in the kingdom of god his word his revelation the truths huh everything he has given us okay guard our minds you no know, guard our whole our guard our salvation right we need to guard our salvation with fear and trembling you know and also that we um guard and protect what is entrusted to us people guard and protect them from false doctrines false teachings okay also a good steward ensures continuity that means make sure that when he is not there the work is not just left somebody else is there and is able to manage and continue the work or uh, being a good steward okay so if you are running a ministry or a church you know sometimes we think it's all about i me myself i don't want anyone to be in my position but what if suddenly we die you know did we have somebody or train somebody who can continue the work after us or is the work going to fall that is very very important so good steward ensures continuity okay now let's look at the two parables one in luke chapter 12 and the other in luke chapter 16 um okay a good steward is faithful and wise okay so here we see that um you know um in luke chapter 12 verses 21 to 48 peter is asking jesus about the parable and he's asking him to uh, explain he says who then is a faithful and wise steward that his master will make him ruler over his entire household okay so who is a faithful and a wise steward somebody who is able to manage what has been entrusted to them and bring about productivity or multiplication or growth and when the person is able to do that what will the person receive reward what is a reward ah the master will make him ruler over his household and give him many more responsibilities there will be promotion and there will be a greater level of stewardship which means he will be entrusted with more okay and also stewardship is not doing what we like what we want to do but doing what the master wants look at verse 47 can somebody read that please and that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes yes so here is a servant who knew his master's will but did not prepare himself or do according to his will so it's important who's a wise and faithful steward steward one who does also what his master wills okay and um, uh, let's look at the unjust steward okay an unjust steward uh, in luke chapter 16 so here you know rich man he hears that one of his steward is wasting his goods and he calls him uh, and asks him to give an account of his stewardship and so he realizes that the steward realizes that he's soon going to be thrown out okay so what does he do he goes to the all the debtors who owe this rich man money or goods or whatever and he tells them to reduce their debts why does he do that why does he do that 
he can take the money later so that he becomes friends with them he has favor with them so when he loses this job at least somebody else will have mercy on him and give him a job or help him out okay so here we see that jesus is commending this towards saying you know he's actually in one way praising him for even though he's done something wrong he's praising him because he's somebody who is using uh, foresight and thoughtfulness that means he's using foresight and being very thoughtful about his future okay but even though jesus was commending him praising him for what he has done applauding him for what he's done but yet jesus says that he is an unjust or a, a steward or a crooked manager he's not approving of his uh is work or what he has um done okay so here we see that um you know even as jesus commended the fact that he acted wisely and in a prudent manner that showed thoughtfulness and foresight but you know he used his position and his money and the money to build friendships but yet you know um we see that uh, he calls him an unjust steward okay and he is dismissed from his position okay so what is basically jesus teaching us here what is basically jesus teaching us here ha huh? that the people in this world use a lot of they are very clever they are very strategic in their thinking okay and uh, in their dealing with the worldly affairs and so he's saying you know as spiritual minded people as followers of the light we too have to be you know we too have to be uh, prudent we too have to be wise we too have to be clever in the way and strategic in the way that we are going about building god's kingdom we cannot just be naive and childish but we need to be prudent uh, we need to be smart we need to be wise not in the wrong way okay uh, in the right way but you know jesus is using this parable basically to encourage us to be wise and pr prudent in handling the spiritual affairs or spiritual matters well okay so in uh, when we build god's kingdom we think we don't need strategy we don't need prudence we don't need wisdom sh sharpness smartness you know we just go as the leading of the holy spirit or we just do what you know we feel is the norm and what everybody has been doing no we need some good strategies we need to be smart and clever but in the spirit in the spiritual sense okay so that we can do what has been entrusted to us in um you know uh, in handling the spiritual affairs well wisely smartly and prudently okay so that is what jesus is trying to tell us in this the son so that is why he says a uh, um uh, a steward is faithful and wise okay um so a steward is faithful and wise he is also faithful in uh, some things that we can learn from this parable in luke chapter 16 a steward can, is should be faithful in little things when we are faithful in little things more will be entrusted to us but sometimes you know we uh, think that oh it's just a small responsibility i'll do it or we can take a casual approach we can say it's okay you know something will do but if you're given a big responsibility then you know we want to really you know pull ourselves up but even when we're given small responsibility which is really you know not really big and showcasing ourselves you know we need to take do that with care and diligence and wisely and sincerely and faithfully okay a good steward is also faithful in handling money okay here in this parable uh you know it talks about handling money it uh, talks about the unrighteous mammon okay uh, but even if its mammon is basically wealth or riches or money even as wealth and riches and money is unrighteous means it leads us away from god it brings in greed and it brings in pride and takes us away from god but yet you know uh, god is paying a is saying that you know um we we need to be good stewards of the money that he has entrusted to 
us. Okay, so it's interesting that Jesus is stating that we need to properly handle the money. When we properly handle the money, the wealth, the riches that He's entrusted to us, you know, we can be uh, be entrusted with greater things in the kingdom. Okay, look at verse eleven. What does it say? Can somebody read that verse eleven? Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will who will commit your trust the true riches? Yes, if you are not faithful in the wealth, the riches, the money that God has given to us, you know, uh, uh, you know, will God commit to us or trust to us the true riches, the true wealth of His kingdom? Okay, a good steward is faithful in what belongs to another man we've already seen that you know that qualifies us to be a good steward okay so sometimes god can put us into other people's uh, mi missions or um, you know into other people's um, ministry or church and uh, because it is not our own venture it's not what god has entrusted to us sometimes we can be very very careless we can uh, you know not uh, given our hundred percent, be unfaithful, not being good stewards, not being making those sacrifices, not being responsible, not looking for productivity and bearing fruit. You know, uh, and when we do that, you know, God, we do not qualify for God to entrust us with our own. So, what qualifies to end uh, for God to entrust us with the own? or his own plans and purposes for our lives is when we are faithful in what has been entrusted to us or when we are faithful in other people's um, you know business or other people's um, ministry or other people's church okay so that is about um, uh, stewardship and these are some of the few things that we learn from this parable in Luke chapter 16 any questions on this chapter before we move on to chapter 6. Any questions? Online students always very quiet, no interaction. Can we have some interaction, please? Any questions anyone has, anyone of you have? Yes, Pastor. So uh, about uh, when you said about being smart mm -hmm. and so being led by the spirit. So the world has so many strategies that they have and they do it for their own achievement and for their own uh, growth and not seeing the welfare or, or the betterment of others, Pastor. But then when you said about that, uh, we should also be smart. So uh, yeah, can I have more clarity on that, Pastors? Because uh, whatever, like, I mean, it, this is my personal thing. What, whenever I see the world, they're like more of themselves, what they thought is about their dream, their desires. And then they bring in sometimes even believers have seen, they bring in the scripture to achieve their own purpose. But as uh, stewards and what God has entrusted us with. So we have the word, then we have the Holy Spirit. So uh, where is the balance, Pastor? Like, how can we... Uh, balance this and be more smart at the same time go in line with the will of god and under the holy spirit's submission yeah thank you jackin for the question so here we are talking about smartness wisdom prudence in handling spiritual affairs well so when we talk about that we're talking in the framework of being kingdom citizens so we're talking in the framework of kingdom culture kingdom values kingdom principles and kingdom lifestyle and so where do we get our kingdom principles values and lifestyle from the word of god so uh, when we're talking about being smart is you know using smart strategies uh, to uh, share the gospel uh, to so even in in our context you know uh, you, uh, we have this anti conversion bill the law that has been passed so uh, for catalyst i'm talking because i'm part of catalyst and you know school outreach ministry we basically had written a curriculum and it was full scripture based okay first part of the, the son is who jesus is second one is sin and salvation right attitudes wrong attitudes and everything is scripture based everything is stories from the bible 
So we realized that after the pandemic, when schools opened, uh, we want to again start Catalyst in schools because the school outreach ministry, we realized that we can't go with the same curriculum. Nobody is going to take the curriculum. So we we can't just be, we can't go and say, okay, let's just do it in some Christian schools where they will take us. Uh, even some Christian schools were not willing to take us uh, because of the fear of what the repercussions can be. So we had to be smart enough. So what is the strategy that we can use? We have the potential to reach out to students. We have to reach out to children in schools. How can we reach out? So we started, we we came up with the idea of, uh, uh, you know, writing um, a separate curriculum where it is basically, um, you know, value education. So nowadays values is very important because after pandemic, children's values have really gone to a very different level, you know. Mm -hmm. So the teachers are finding it difficult, schools are finding it, and they're welcome to value education and, you know, uh, life skills. So we use that, but we, we told them it's based on biblical principles and uh, they said you shouldn't use Jesus's name and all that's fine but we're using biblical principles and we also tell them we are using bible stories they said no you can't use bible stories so we said see some of the parables like the parable of the lost son is also given in moral science books okay mm. so we're just going to use basic stories and so that is how we were able to get inroads into the a school so how do we how do we do that of course we had uh, the holy spirits uh, you know guiding us giving us the wisdom the strategy what is the curriculum to use and we had to use uh, we had to be smart we can't just say okay they're not using uh, uh, we can't use scripture curriculum so shut down catalyst we can't go and minister in schools you know so be smart enough to break, come up with different strategies so that we can reach out and build god's kingdom and not be like the world where we're doing it just because, uh, you know, we want to uh, get money out of Catalyst. No, we don't uh, charge anything from the schools. We don't want to build an empire out of Catalyst. That's not what we just want to extend uh, God's kingdom. And we're not doing it just because we want our project to be known and for name and fame. No, we want to build God's kingdom. Did that help, Jackin? Yes, Pastor, it was very clear because you explained practical approach how you did. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Jackin. Uh, so here Sri Rana says that some minister, some minister of God tells God has given me these people and I should protect my sheep. It's faithfulness. But on the other hand, they are so insecure to give them an opportunity. So how can they be faithful to what God gave them? Because we have to nurture people and in our walk, uh, uh, we need to nurture people and in our walk in his kingdom we face these kind of challenges yes a uh, good uh, question Sri Radha so the next um, uh, lesson chapter 6 is basically talking about building people in the spirit so we will look at various things and I or we I have also spoken and thought about this in um, uh, your uh, first year when we ministers foundation basically when we did the chapter people in uh, code of uh, honor okay the uh, the publication code of honor and the most of what we studied in code of honor is here in chapter six building people by the spirit so we look at this chapter and at the end of the chapter if you still have your um, questions and your queries uh, not answered then you can raise it up and i will answer it is that fine sri radha okay thank you um, so good questions. Anyone else has any questions, any doubts? Okay, if not, we'll move on to chapter six. Okay, uh, building people by the spirit. Okay, now kingdom building, what is it about? Is it building organizations, ministries, uh, churches, uh, building uh, buildings for people to meet as churches? What is kingdom building? Kingdom building is, is building people, okay? So when we're actually building ministries, we're building uh, churches, we're actually building people. And how do we build people? Not by what? Not we, how we feel, not what we want, how God wants, okay? How he's purposed it to be, what he envisions, how he wills, and also by the spirit okay so we look at kingdom building is all about building people and building them by the 
spirit. Most of what we have uh, is written here is a repetition from the chapter people. I think it's the third chapter in Code of Honor, and we already studied that quite in detail. But I understand that some of them uh, have uh, taken this course newly uh, and they were not there in the first year. Some of them are online students, e-learning students. So we'll go through it um, um, in, uh, you know, we look, we look at this lesson, okay? So here we see that kingdom building is all about people, okay? So look at what uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9. He says, yeah, read it. Uh, okay. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's feet. You are God's building. Yes. So he says, we are co-workers with God in building his kingdom. And who does he say is God's field and God's building? The people, right. Okay. So that is very clear. Okay. Uh, and look at what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse uh, 1. I am I not an apostle? I am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? Okay, so, uh, you know, people are questioning who Paul is, you know. And so he's saying that, hey, you know, he could have, uh, uh, he says, you know, um, the work, my labor, who is my work and my labor? What is the fruit of my work and my labor? Who is the fruit of my work and labor, Paul says? People, are you not the uh, fruit of my work and my labor you know so paul could have actually pointed out to the many missionary journeys to the many books he had uh, letters he had written to the many people that he had mentored leaders he had raised the churches that he had established but who does he point as his work in the lord he points to people he's got that really right okay so um he even says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 22, he says, in whom you are also being built together for a dwelling place of God in the spirit. Okay. So we see here that God is not constructing buildings or he's not just developing organizations, but it's all about building people. So even when Jesus came, he did not come for, you know, he did not come to raise a army you know, to fight or to be as a king, to be served. He did not come to be enthroned in a position, but he, day by day on a daily basis, he was there out in the marketplaces ministering to people, okay? So uh, God's people are his dwelling place and they are being built together. Look at what First Peter chapter 2, verse 5 says. He says that, you know, uh, he's talking about a spiritual house. And who is he referring to as living stones? The people, okay? People are the living stones who are being built up into a spiritual house. So sometimes, you know, we can get carried away in, in the kingdom of God, in building the kingdom of God, in thinking that, you know, we are building great big churches and organizations and great ministries, you know, where there's a name and fame is, you know, throughout the world. But in the process, we fail to realize that we are actually here to build people, not to build a name of fame and empire, you know, or a kingdom in its Kingdom within a kingdom. Sometimes we're building kingdoms within God's kingdom, right? We're building our own kingdom where we are the rulers, where we are the kings, okay? When we want our name and fame to be known in history. But actually, we are here to build a spiritual house, a spiritual kingdom, okay? A spiritual kingdom, which is a spiritual house, and a spiritual house is made up of living stones, not dead stones, okay? And kingdom building is about building people, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, and when uh, in kingdom building is, uh, you know, when we can build people in an effective way when we have them in our hearts, okay? That is very, very important because when we have them in our hearts, we can, we have the authority by God to speak into their hearts. 
you know sometimes uh, we are so uh, caught up to build up a big organization a big ministry becomes very famous a big church where our name is known where we're using the latest uh, technology and all of those things all of those things are very important yes we must be smart and wise and you know use all of these strategies but if we fail to build people then we will see that people in our churches are actually going away from God. We don't see the glory of God manifested in our churches, in our organization. We don't see the work of God. We don't see the move of God. And then we uh, wonder why, because we're there actually to build a kingdom or an empire, but we are not there to build people. And, you know, we don't have in our hearts to actually minister to people. And our heart is to, you know, bring about fame and uh, position and power and make our organization or our church famous. That becomes the core motives of our heart. And God sees our heart motives more than, you know, um, uh, what we do. So if our heart motive is people that we want to build people, we want to invest and speak into their lives, then God will give us the authority. And so when we speak, you know, whatever we speak will uh, build them up in their hearts and in their lives. Okay, we'll stop now and we'll continue after the break. Thank you.